Hi, everybody. It's Denise again. Up next, we're going to hear from three families that have children with mutations in three different greed genes. And because Kiergren's a family-led organization, we put patients and families at the center of everything we do. And that's why we want to start by opening up these stories in these families to you. Up next, we have Amy Murphy. She's a Grin 2A mom and will be sharing her daughter's story. Hi, my name's Amy. My husband couldn't be here today, so I'm gonna just stick up a quick picture of Paul. But I'm here to tell you a little bit about our daughter, Katie, who has a really rare mutation called GRIC2. And it's so rare that she was the first person diagnosed with it. We got our diagnosis for her when she was eight. Uh, it's a de novo mutation, which means it's not inherited. It's something that just spontaneously happens. So anyway, this GRIC2 has affected her basically her whole life. She started out as a pretty typical baby until she did not hit her milestone for sitting. So that was the first inkling we had that something was going on. Um, she sat probably a year after a typical child sits and still she was kind of wobbly. So her balance wasn't very good, but it affected everything. It affected her physically from she never crawled. She walked when she was five. Her balance isn't great. Her motor skills are not good. She can only say mama, and sometimes she'll say yeah appropriately, but that's about all she says. She does communicate through an iPad, and uh, we have a program on there where she can press a button to say, you know, her throat hurts or to say I want a cookie and that kind of thing. Um, but it's pretty simple, pretty basic. And she does have a couple signs she will use for us uh, to tell us, you know, she wants more or she's hungry, that kind of thing. Um, cognitively, she's pretty good. I mean, she's, you know, she's 15, so she's definitely more of at a toddler stage, I would say, for kind of everything. But cognitively, if I say, Katie, turn around and hand me that book. She'll do that. So she understands a lot of basic things. And I have put together some pictures and some videos of her just to kind of give you a better understanding of what she's going through and how far she's come. So here's one of my very favorite early pictures of Katie. And when she was born, she did have a little bit of jaundice, but uh, it went away with some sunlight. So that wasn't a big concern. Took our baby home. My sisters came out to visit and I remember I was changing Katie on the changing table and we were just kind of laughing because Katie's stomach was so soft. She had like no muscle tone. We were laughing about her having this little jelly belly. It was probably one of the first signs that I missed that something was not quite right. Uh, she could not sit up. She didn't hit that milestone. And normally a kid sits around 12 months. I think she was 18. So we would put her in this little chair to kind of prop her up because she would just fall left and right when she finally was able to sit up, which was pretty late. I had to hold her up. If we were at the grocery store, I'd have to hold her like this in the grocery cart. She just had no uh, core strength. And another thing was she was really flexible. And she would stand like this um, on her foot when she was finally able to stand, which was delayed too. Uh, she also loved to strike this pose once she was able to stand up. And this video just kind of shows you a little bit. When she was five is when she started walking. And this is probably, I don't know, six, maybe six years old. But you can see she's just not very balanced. Her arms are kind of all over the place. Katie started therapies at age one, and I remember they wanted her to pull these apart, which I thought, there is no way. And of course she could not. She did many years later. But she has always enjoyed therapy. She takes all of them, speech, OT, PT. We did horse therapy early on. She was probably four. She took it for about five years, really helped her with her core strength. This is another therapy we did. It, this suit helps her uh, body be in the right position. It really helped her a lot with her balance. 
Katie wore glasses for a couple of years. She eventually did outgrow the need for them, which can happen. She was in a walker for several years. She couldn't bear any weight, so this helped keep her upright and moving. She wore this swash, which is a device that helps keep her legs from scissoring, keeps her hips in the right position. She has had leg braces since she was one, still wears them today. She was in this compression suit. We tried it out uh, to help her realize where her body is in space, but we didn't use it very long since it's so hot in Phoenix. Katie always has to be uh, stabilized in a car. This is a picture of her in a bus. A few random things. She's a very happy kid, always has been. She does have some moments, but typically she's happy. Really good sleeper, sleeps about 11 hours a night. She's a great eater. She's gluten-free, but she will eat a big variety of foods. She didn't start doing her pincer grasp until she was about five, which is really late. Same with pointing, five years old, I believe. And when she could finally do this puzzle around that age, I was thrilled because she wasn't interested in that before then. Uh, she does not travel well. This was our last trip and it was really hard. So we haven't traveled in about four years with her. She will not push her hair out of the way. She did have barrettes in her hair here, but they fell out and she will never push her hair out of the way, which is odd. She loves being in dress up clothes, especially, I think she knows these are pretty little outfits and she enjoys dressing up in them. And Halloween is always, a favorite holiday get to pick out something cute for her to wear we do keep a gate on her door even though she has never gotten out of her bed to walk around I just am concerned about that anyway I uh, went to a movie a few times but unless there's food in front of her she will want to leave uh, we replace the bib with this armband she just wipes it across her face if she's drooling which she does still drool some of her favorite things, she enjoys watching TV and movies, and I'm sure I forced the Brady Bunch upon her here. She loves any kind of musical. Here's The Greatest Showman. I think that's her most favorite. Reading books has always been interesting to her. She loved looking at pictures as a baby. She can't really read as far as I know, but uh, she will always like to look through magazines or books. Swimming, we're in Arizona, so she enjoys being in the pool. Uh, she sometimes likes painting. She does have some sensory issues, so it takes a while to get her used to putting her hands in something like that. She has always loved any kind of motion. I push her around our house in her high chair when she was a baby. Here she is uh, at some ride we were on and just loved it, totally in her element. I think one of the best things about Katie is she's really funny and she likes to make people laugh. She's got a good sense of humor and she threw these cards all over the place right when I was finished putting them all back in their place and thought that was pretty funny. She enjoys being silly with me and she picked up my robe and put it on her head like this and I turned around and there she was laughing and giggling. When we got her diagnosis, we went to TGen here in Phoenix, saw Dr. Narayanan, who's in charge of the genomic sequencing, the gene sequencing, and he was the one who found out she had a GRIC2 mutation. Dr. Narayanan then found Dr. Swanson at Northwestern University who is an expert in this type of research and he has taken on Katie and her GRIC2 mutation and done a lot of pretty cool things including a mouse model. So I feel really good that we have a great scientist trying to help us out and figure out ways to help us and now these other kids too. Um, I'm also really thankful that we are now included in this larger group. I have my shirt on, Cure Grin. And this group, well, this is the group. <laughs> um, thank you for including us in the group because it means a ton. 
and I'm so thankful now we will have more resources available and, and a, you know, maybe a better outlook for the future. So thanks for listening. Wow, Amy, thanks for sharing that so much. I think we can all relate to so many things that you, you shared today. Our next speaker is Michelle Kelly. She's a grin to a mom. Take it away, Michelle. Hi, my name's Michelle and I'm mom to Ashley, who will be 15 on the 12th of September. She has a GRIA 2 related neurodevelopment disorder. Um, she has a three letter word missing from the middle of the GRIA 2 gene, which is three amino acids, which um, I'm told is loss of function of the AMPA receptor. Um, she has, she is non-verbal, um, cortical visual impairment, uh, sensory proprioceptive disorder. Um, she's incontinent, wears um, pads night and day, no um, sense of danger, um, goes uh, switches between moods, very challenging behaviour. Um, so she can go from spending hours a day screaming to um, overexcited, like majorly overexcited. Um, these behaviours can switch, I call them, um, like they, they just switch literally from screaming, she can be the happiest girl in the world the next minute and the next minute after that she can be aggressive um, um, and that, that switches between those behaviours, very rarely calm. Um, so yeah, uh, first started to notice issues when she was just over one. Um, when she was just over one, uh, she started, so she did normal development until around that age. And then she started to lose skills, um, uh, wasn't babbling, um, couldn't really wait bear, uh, repetitive behaviours. Um, so I took her to see a paediatrician who said that Ashley probably has an unknown genetic condition, um, which started obviously the road to um, trying to find out um, which genetic condition Ashley had. Um, she's had a few tests over the years, uh, Rett tested for Rett syndrome, um, Angelman syndrome, Batten's disease, the usual chromosome analysis, um, all the usual tests that come with development delay um, uh, and it took until 2017 to find out about the GRIA 2. Um, when we first found out about GRIA 2 I was over the moon like finally we knew what condition Ashley had um, but unfortunately no one else in the UK knew anything about GRIA 2 so we knew her condition but there was no help for the condition. So it was, um, yeah, kind of a bit of uh, quite upsetting, to be honest, because we didn't know anyone else with the condition. It was very rare. Um, used to continually research when Ashley was in bed um, on the internet every evening, typing in GRIA 2, GRIA, all think you know AMPA receptors never found anything um wasn't actually officially diagnosed until 2019 I think um but yeah just one day I typed in GRIA 2 into Facebook and came across the group that Heather had started so that was fantastic you know gave that really did give me hope um and then I obviously came across other people with the condition. I did actually know um, our researcher, Vincenzo, put me in touch with Laura. And so Laura has a son, Tim, with the condition. So it was nice to be connected. And they're so similar as well. The children are so similar. 
Um, so yeah, basically it was only Laura that we knew and then um, another lady joined our group. Um, finally, we all joined the same group, which Heather started. And then I came across Cure Grin. So it's been fantastic, really. And I just want to say thanks so much for including all the GREE conditions. So basically, the main struggle for us is um, challenging behaviour. It stops us being able to live nor and you know a somewhat normal life, to be honest. Um, Ashley, Ashley's when Ashley's aggressive, she's very um, she hits out um, very difficult hours and hours a day screaming. Um, it's hard to watch your child go through it and not be able to help them in any way. Um, we are trialing medication um, with a psychiatrist. Um, the medication that we're trialing at the moment is carbamazepine liquid and fluoxetine. Um, the carbamazepine has helped with the fluctuations in behaviour, so we don't have as many fluctuations throughout the day, but the periods of the behaviours are for much longer. Um, so typical day, Ashley could wake up at, say, um, seven, um, sometimes within an hour um, or a couple of hours. She just from nowhere goes from happy to screaming. And the screaming can last for hours. Um, you just, there's nothing you can do to help her come out of it. You can't console her. Um, if you go near her, she becomes aggressive. You just have to wait for that episode to pass. Um, when that finally passes, she becomes overexcited. The overexcited um, is when she can cause damage to herself or others. Um, she's not aware of herself within space, so... Yeah, um, sorry, I've never done anything like this before, so it's really, really new to me. Um, so yeah, uh, the main thing for us is challenging behaviour. I, I can, the only way I can describe it is like epilepsy. So however, it's not fits, it's behaviour. It's like a, a switch that just happens and then the behaviour just changes. She can go from the happiest girl in the world to um the most depressed person in the world it's it's so um distressing for her and us um no one seems to be able to help so like i said no intervention seems to be able to help you kind of just have to wait for these episodes to pass um yeah there's not really I, I mean, for the future, it would really help us. I mean, I don't know how much everybody knows about how how um, your life can be with a very challenging child. And I feel guilty saying how much it affects us because there are children who are quite poorly. And Ashley's not poorly. She's quite healthy and, you know, always been quite a healthy child. But this challenging behaviour is so, so difficult and it does stop us living, you know, it, you know, to, to anyone else who doesn't live with challenging behaviour, you might not think it's a big thing, but it, it's, it is, it is such a big thing and it has such um, an impact on the whole family. Um, you can't live normally, you know, it's impossible, you can't. You can't just get up and say we're going to do this today you know it it's it's just so hard but it is my life so i'm used to it and it, it's hard to explain it to people that don't know about it so i'm hoping you know you all do understand um how difficult that could be um finding for me all, all i'm at all i my hopes are is that we could find a medication that could just um like 
allow uh, calm Ashley to allow her to be able to experience have the same life experiences or similar life experiences to someone that didn't have a greed disorder um and I do have hope for that I do have hope for a medication of some kind or you know something that could help her um live a normal life or or somewhat normal life um it's any 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 parent's hope for their child to just be able to live and have life experiences um so yeah i mean basically that's all i would want for ashley um you know because in, in between all these behaviors you do have snippets of um uh you know she's such a she, Beneath, beneath the challenging behaviour, she's such a beautiful, lovely child, you know, she's so loving, um, she's got a brilliant sense of humour, um, you know, she, she, you know, she's my world, like, like all of our children, you know, and I just really would like to find something that can calm her enough to be able to you know, live a somewhat normal life, really. I hope this is okay. Um, I look forward to meeting you all um, on the conference and hopefully I can join it, <laughs> depending on behaviour. Um, but I just want to say thanks again to um, Keith for including Gray and to everybody who works in the foundation and also to Heather for actually bringing us all together. Um, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I hope I've covered some, um, th you know, some important things. Like I said, it's hard to describe a life that um, you are used to. So it is normal life for us. However, I would like it to be calmer. <laughs> um, thanks again. I um, hope to meet you even virtually soon. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing such a powerful story and um, a glimpse of what it's like to live in our world day to day. And finally, we have Matthew Williams, a Grin 2A dad. Hi, everyone at the Grin Conference. This is Max Sen. And I'm Matthew, Max's dad. Um, and we're here to talk you through Max's Grin story. So Max is, <laughs> Max is a, a busy 10 year old. Um, he's uh, got, he's been diagnosed with a Grin 2A mutation, um, but that wasn't diagnosed until he was about six years of age. Before that, um, we had the diagnosis about six months of age where he was diagnosed with quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Um, he has lots of other conditions as well. So he has um, uncontrolled epilepsy that started um, on his first birthday. Um, he also has um, uncontrollable bond and reflux, laryngeal malacia. Um, he's fed, um, he's got a gastro and jeg tube. So we feed him into one and, and take bile out the other. Um, he, he has lots of pain and spasms. He also has a condition called cortical visual impairment. So he's registered blind. Um, Maxim was diagnosed with Grin 2A around six months of age. He uh, we'd kind of been managing all of his symptoms with the assumption he had cerebral palsy, but we kind of knew he had something different because his symptoms weren't typical of a normal cerebral palsy kid. Um, he just didn't react to, to medications and treatments as, as the doctors really expected. Um, I, I was speaking to a lady on, on Facebook um, and she mentioned that there was a study going on worldwide that, that our local Cardiff University was involved in where they were looking for genetic causes of um, kids with epilepsy. So, so we got Max in that, in that study. They took our blood, disappeared. We didn't hear from them for two years and we kind of forgot about it. And then they contacted us out of the blue and said, we, kind of, we know what the cause is. Um, and they said he's got a mutation of Grin 2 AG and they explained to us sort of about NNDA receptors and all the stuff I'm guessing the, the doctors will talk about today. And yeah, it was a relief really. So we knew something was wrong, but we never knew what it was. And we kind of, before that, we, we said it doesn't really matter if we find the cause because it doesn't really make a difference. 
but but it, it has. We've changed Max's medication, and now a lot of his medications are centered around the NMDA receptor. Yeah, and the doctors take into account um, take into account any time they they choose a medication. So it's kind of whittled down the, the medications that that we can select from, and it means that we, we can get things that are more direct and, and more specifically targeted um, for Maxine. Uh, it's also meant that we've been able to, um, you know, find the, the Grin and the Grin 2A communities, really. Um, and we've, yeah, we've, we've, we've made some friends there and we've, we've, we get some real support. And it's nice to be able to speak to other families who experience um, similar challenges, really. Max's typical day is really busy. Um, he, especially now that his, his, his chest problems have got worse over the last, um, the last two years. He, he has two lots of, of medications a day, really, two bundles. Um, and because he's judge fed, they take over an hour to go in twice a day. So that means that's a busy time. He also has four lots of, of four bunches of different nebulizers um, throughout the day. Um, that makes it harder for returning to school now, especially with COVID now. And um, the fact that no one wants people's kind of germs in the air. Um, but we don't really let that hold Max in back. So we, we try and make Maxine's life as, as fun as possible. So he enjoys doing things like he likes playing with his Switch toys. He loves um, using his iGaze computer. Um, we've got him playing the Nintendo Switch. So he now, he's been catching Pokemon on Pokemon Snap. Um, yeah. And we've been playing Metopia and he's loving that. Um, and we just try and make life as, as fun as possible. Max loves watching Pokemon and, and cartoons and Netflix and Disney Plus, yeah. Loves all that. And loves all the Marvel films. Um, a bit gutted we haven't got to see the newest one in the cinema. Um, but as soon as things calm down, we'll, we'll be getting back to our tradition of going to see the Marvel films um, as a family and sneaking Max in, even though he's not 12 yet. Yeah. Um, and Max, you know, Max... Is a pretty smart kid. He's learned some signs in school, so he'll say funny. Um, he'll say school. He puts his two hands together to say brother. Um, if he puts one hand over the other, he's saying that's naughty. Um, if he folds his arms, he's talking about friends. Um, so Max uses these techniques as well as eye pointing to be able to communicate with us. Um, he's a pretty, pretty smart kid. Um, hope you have a lovely day at the conference. Um, look forward to watching um, everyone else's videos and presentations. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy, Michelle, and Matthew for sharing such powerful and moving stories. It's such an honor for us to be able to share your family stories and struggles and um, help create awareness for greed disorder. Up next, we have Searching for a Cure with Gene Therapy coming up on the main stage. So just stay tuned.